resume recording so we can make sure we capture this. Um, all right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, thanks everybody for being here today. Um, uh, I haven't been here the last couple of weeks. A couple of my generator teammates have been uh, here to help kind of facilitate the last two webinars. So I'm really excited to be back, especially talking about what Mark's here to talk to us about today. Um, before we uh, get to Mark, which is the most important part, um, I want to welcome everybody, say thanks for coming. Um, again, just as a reminder of who I am. So I work for a company called Generator. Uh, Generator is uh, an equity-based accelerator for startups out of Wisconsin, but we have partnered with the ISBDC here um, to run this small business resiliency and recovering training series. Um, and we're going to be here to facilitate and bring in wonderful speakers uh, to help businesses be prepared to either come back from the COVID crisis or drive forward outside of the COVID crisis. And so um, these webinars are open to anybody and they are available every Friday um, from noon to one uh, between now and March of uh, 2021. So please join us. Please uh, invite folks to come uh, be part of this. We're here to be a resource for the community um, and we want everybody to take part. So um, with that quick uh, intro, I'd like to introduce Mark um, from Quintegra. He's here to talk to us today about um, hiring um, and hiring in a pandemic. So uh, Mark, I'd love to turn it over to you. I will stop my screen share here and let you take it away. We got Well, you. thank you. Great. Th thank you everybody for uh, joining um, online. I mean, obviously these are um, times of, uh, of challenge um, in some certain areas. And so what I'm hoping to do is just share a little bit about um, Quintegra, Quintegra's story. Um, and then we'll get into a little bit around hiring and a very, very special program um, that's out there uh, for business owners um, that the ISBDC has uh, put together. And so um, the name of uh, my company is Quintegra Resourcing. Um, we have, uh, we've, hang on here, make sure this is working. Um, we, we've been around since 1997. We were one of those companies that um, got started and we did a pilot with ABB Robotics and they wanted to basically outsource the recruitment function. So instead of going to outside agencies, they wanted to be able to outsource it to us. We did a pilot with them. And then we went after a great big contract, like that little dog who goes chasing after the bus. And we actually caught the bus. Um, and we were one of the first recruitment process outsourcing service companies for Deloitte and Touche in the U.S. and Canada. So as an organization, we went from, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollar firm to about a four million dollar firm. Matter of fact, that first year we were Ernest & Young's entrepreneurial finalist. Um, from there, in 1999, we exclusively focused on large national clients. So those that hired between two and a thousand permanent hires a year. Clients like Siemens, um, Abbott, Lilly, um, Conseco back in that 1999 when they did all their hiring. That was our firm. We were the back room doing the recruitment um, for those organizations. After that, about two to three years after that, we decided to expand globally. And so we had uh, research centers um, in India. We took on global clients, a couple of big gas companies. And so we were no longer just servicing the US. We were servicing different parts um, of the world for them. And so things were going along extremely fast. Um, things were going along. Um, everything was, was, was great. One of those American dreams, right, um, that we have. And so we continued through to 2008. Um, obviously, um, 2008, we had the global financial crisis, and we were in the high volume permanent outsourcing business, um, not a great place to be. And so obviously, unemployment was well above 10%. Um, all of our clients canceled. And so we were just in the wrong industry at the wrong time. Um, personally, I owned 100% um, of the company. Um, we had to reduce our overhead by 90%. So we had all this going this way, and then all of a sudden we completely stopped. Um, as the owner, um, we, gosh, we had over a, uh, 
a million dollars in debt we accumulated. Um, obviously, we got down only to just a few individuals um, with that. And, and we were at a real, real pivot point, um, very similar as a lot of companies are here today. And so at that time, um, we decided that we would no longer just take on large clients um, with high volume because it wasn't out there, but we would start focusing on small clients. How do we help back in 2008? How do we help companies with a critical hire? What can we do to help companies get through that? And so at that point, we created the second service um, that helped entrepreneurial companies with the critical hires to get their business up and growing. Um, if I fast forward to today, um, we have experience in most industries across the US and Canada. We have two service lines. We service national outsourcing clients, but we spend a lot of time and a, a majority of our services providing a critical hire solution to small or startup businesses from that side. Um, the, the reason I think I tell you my story in Quintegra is, is because I, we learned a few things. I learned a few things as a business owner. Uh, three things I realized. One is, you know what, being a business owner or a leader can just flat out be lonely. Um, you know what, it's just can be a lonely position to where nobody truly understands how it is. And, and again, you know, as I went through it, you know, my, my wife and my kids didn't necessarily understand because, you know, they didn't run a company. Um, and so at that time, it became very lonely. The second thing I realized is you're isolated. As a business leader or owner, you simply can be isolated. Everybody's looking at you. Everybody's looking at you to know what you want them to do. Your clients are looking at you for demands. Your vendors are looking at you. Um, your employees, if you have any, are looking at you. So you can become very isolated. And then the third thing basically is I just became overwhelmed. Um, there's just not enough hours in the day. It's just, there's more work to be done than you know what to do with. And I'm sure everybody listening to this who's been in a leadership or, or an ownership role gets it, right? Um, we're just flat out overwhelmed. And, and so what I realized is when you're overwhelmed like that, what happens most of the time is you start work, you don't work on your business. Instead, we, we start working in our business and we got our heads down so far that we can't really work on our business. And as we know, if you're working in it and not on it, it's hard to grow it. And so here today, I'd like to talk about one solution. Um, if you are overwhelmed, that can possibly help you work on your business versus in your business. And so what I, we did or what you can do is you can hire an employee. And so by hiring an employee, what happens is it frees your time up, allows you to focus on key critical areas of your business to help grow it. And not only do I think we want to hire an employee, but let's be honest, we really want to hire a winning employee. You know, we want to hire somebody that's going to come in, somebody that's going to take the pressure off of us, someone that's going to come in and help us grow that business. And so today, um, what I'd like to discuss is a process for how do you hire winning employees. And so we'll get into some fairly detail here of some steps and some processes of how do you hire a winning pro or employee. The second thing is, is the ISBDC has come out with a new hire program. And it is fantastic for those that want to hire an employee, though, actually, they've invested a tremendous amount of resources and money in order to provide this service for free. And so we'll discuss that, too. I guess if we're going to talk about hiring a winning employee, maybe we should define that winning employee. So obviously, we're probably looking for somebody that possesses competencies required to succeed in the role. Right. We want somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, we also want somebody that fits into our culture and our style of organization, especially when you're a small organization, you know, you want them to be able to fit into the culture, you want them to understand the style and, and, and what our value proposition is, we want somebody that's going to achieve results, right, and expect consistency, so you can depend on them over and over, um, and obviously it'd be great if they could keep raising the bar, because if they become that type of employee, then it's going to help us sleep better at night um, from that side. There are basically five key principles that I'd like to kind of go through and have you keep in mind as you're looking to hire that winning employee. First one is, is if you don't know where you're going, how do you know when you get there? 
And so, so many times what happens is, is, is we look and say, I know we need to hire and we start looking at people, but we don't really have a plan to know where we're trying to go. And so we're gonna walk through how you do that. The second thing is, is once you know what you're looking for and where you're going, you gotta make sure you're fishing in the right pond, which means how can I go and find those individuals that are gonna help me go um, where we wanna go. Third thing is, is, is we'll talk about past performance is the single best predictor of future performance. So how can we find individuals that have done something in the past that helps us understand that they'll be able to do it in the future for our company, so therefore they'll be a winning employee. Next is, is we wanna make sure we're comparing candidates against a standard, not each other. So we wanna be able to set a standard so we know exactly what we're looking for instead of just interviewing people saying, well, I guess this person's the best out of the best. You know, we wanna make sure we're doing it to a standard. And then the last thing is, is we'll talk about one chance to make a good first impression. Um, and how do we do that? First phase is we want to define a job specification. So we need to be able to have a position overview. What do we want this per person to do? What are the roles and responsibilities going to be of this individual? And then there's a couple key things here. One, we need to be able to see what are the must have skills that this person has to have or we will not hire them. And then you'll notice I underline and what are the must have culture fit traits that they must have? So we want to be able to hire with skill of a minimum of certain things, and we want to make sure they fit the culture as we're going through. And so if it's a certain type of job and they have to have a, a certain type of an accounting background, or if they have to have outside sales experience is a must have. And so we want to go through and define the must haves. So therefore, we're kind of building what we're going to be looking for um, when we start looking at different candidates and which pond to fish from. Um, we also want to make sure that um, we understand the compensation, we need to have a compensation program put together for these individuals. And then obviously, if someone's going to leave the current position they're in, why would they want to come and work for you? And so we need to make sure we have a good promotional strategy of how we can sell not only the position, but our company and where we're going in the future. Hey, Mark, quick question for you here. Um, yes. On, on kind of defining that job description, do you find that, especially when it may be the first hire that somebody's making, that like, how do you make sure that you're not asking for qualifications that are too high for the position? Like if, if they don't need to be college educated, but you'd like them to be, but it's not a guarantee, how do you make sure you're not disqualifying candidates by asking for too much qualification? Yeah, and, and that's a, a great point. And, and that's when I, I noticed I used the word must haves. So what you said there was, I would like someone to have a degree, but they don't necessarily have to. So to me, then that wouldn't be a must have. It's a like to have. You know, we're, we're going to go after a like to have, but as, as a business owner, I think you look at it and say, what, what can I not train? They just have to have it. And so if you're in certain industries, they must have to have a degree of a certain type of degree, so if, if it's a financial person, um, or do they not have to have that degree? The question you gotta ask yourself too, if we get into like a sales position, do they have to have sales where they went out and cold called? Would it be okay if they were just taking, picking up leads that came in off the phone? And those are kind of the critical decisions that you make. And that's what I mean, not necessarily, you're not looking for what I'd like to have as much as, you know what, if they have not been outside and cold called on somebody, then, you know, I'm not going to consider them. And so what you're doing is you're kind of building a framework so you don't get yourself in a situation where you really like somebody, but they've never been out and cold called. And then you bring them in the organization and, and, and you like them and they've got great sales skills, but then you, you say, hey, I need you to go bang on these doors and they're they've never done it before. And that's a totally different world than say someone sitting behind the desk, picking up the phone and doing inside sales. And so I think those are the critical things you need to look at and think through. Great question. Thank you. Phase two, once we know what we're looking for and the must haves, and that's what I call search parameters, right? So these are the search parameters that we're looking for. This person who needs to have a, these skills here, then we got to go out and find the candidates. 
And, and obviously there's lots of ways to source candidates. Um, there's companies that you can hire to do it. Um, there's agencies and, and recruiting firms. Um, you can advertise. Um, there's, and I don't want to get into too much detail here just from a time standpoint, but there's lots of ways to go out. The key is, is since we know what we're looking for, we want to make sure we can go out um, and, and be able to present that. Even when you get referrals from individuals, it, my example earlier, if you say, hey, I'm, I'm looking for a salesperson, you might get all kinds of sources. If you say, hey, I'm looking for a salesperson, but they have to have done cold call sales and they have to have a degree. So then it helps people understand what you're looking for. So when they refer in. Um, just a, a note, just so you know what the market's like. Obviously, there's three different types of candidates. There's candidates that are active, which means they're going to find you. You put something out there, they're going to find you. There are candidates that are passive. And these are candidates that say, hey, I'm not real happy in the job I'm in. If something better came along, I would look at it. But, you know, I'm not going to just throw my resume everywhere. Um, and then the last one is what's called direct source. These are candidates that are doing the job today. They're not thinking about making a move, but yet if something was presented to them that looked like a better deal, then they would talk. And so when you think of that, a lot of times what people do is they say, okay, I'm just going to go out and, and look for, you know, I'm going to run an ad. And so that's going to bring in a lot of active candidates. So depending on the type of job you have and the skills you're looking for um, will depend on which one of these methods you'll need to use. An example could be is if you're a construction firm and design firm and you decide you want to go out and get a, a civil, um, you know, project engineer. So you need a civil degree, they need to be a project engineer working in a construction company. You know, there's probably not a lot of ads you're going to run and they're going to come run into you just because they're in such high demand. So you might need to think about how can I get into the passive side and the direct side. So once we know that, that's kind of the sources of candidates. Phase three gets into, okay, now I've got candidates, I'm getting ready to interview them. You know, so now how do I select this one? What kind of process do I use? First thing is, is, is be prepared for the interview. So review the resume, highlight areas you want to probe and questions you want to ask. We talked about um, last, uh, earlier that, you know, past performance kind of predicts future performance. So look at the resume, look at projects they worked on, look at what they've done. Start asking yourself what kind of questions can I ask around to probe into these areas. And the other thing is to set the stage and the agenda for the candidate. Keep them at ease so you can assess them from a culture fit. And so a lot of times when a candidate comes in, you know, let them know how the interview is going to go. Appreciate you coming in. You know, today I'd like to cover three different things. I'd like to really kind of get to know your background better. So I've got a series of questions. Then from that conversation, we'll talk a little bit about um, the job and, and what it entails. And then I'll give you a chance to answer questions. You know, try to put them at ease so you can get a feel for who they really are versus somebody that's super nervous or somebody that's so laid back. Um, you don't get a real feel for, for, for their personality. Other thing is, is focus on the candidate's skills related to the role. And so we've been talking about specific parameters of the search. So try to keep, you know, your focus on what you need to get from the interview. What happens a lot of times with hiring uh, somebody, especially if you don't do it a lot, is you end up having a 45 minute conversation around just other stuff. And you never really honed in on what skills to see if they were truly qualified. Also, again, past performance is the single best predictor of future performance. What you're looking for is what I call transferable skills in culture traits. Can this person take what skills they have and can they transfer them to the skills that I need? And I would say the same thing about culture fit. What have they done in the past and can they transfer that into my environment or my culture? So if you're a one person company right now and you're going to hire your first employee and you know hiring the first employee, you know what, it, it's going to be a person who's going to have to wear many different hats. They're going to have to juggle different things. They're going to have to just be comfortable with two people. And yet you're interviewing people that come from huge companies and they've only worked in big companies. That's all they've worked into is great big companies. Probably to be able to transfer that skill into a small company where there's only two people is probably not very good because they don't really even understand what that means. They might say it. Oh, yeah, I'd like to work for just a small company. But if you've never worked in a small company, kind of like if you've never owned a small business, you don't really get it. 
I'm not saying you don't hire, but be cognizant of that and see if you can probe other things in the background where they had to been part of a small company. An example would be if somebody, maybe their parents owned a business and they worked with their parents in business when they were younger. So there would be an example, they would get what a small company looks like. The last thing is, is um, you, you got to be able to sell your company. You got to know your company's why. You got to describe the culture. You got to be able to talk about the opportunity. And, and it's not, there's nothing wrong with being a startup. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm just getting going, but let me tell you why I started this business and be able to tell that story. Let me tell you why I think this position is important. Let me tell you what the challenges of the position will be. So again, all ahead of time, be thinking through this. So therefore, if it is the right person, they leave knowing here is the opportunity. Effective interview questions, um, you know, try to make sure they're factual and action oriented. Um, they're candidate and role specific. Don't be afraid to ask for follow up and clarification. So I heard you say this and then make sure you follow up and dig a little deeper. A key is examples, right? Examples, examples, examples. You know, let, give me another example of how you did this. Give me an example when you did this. Give me an example when you did that. So again, effective questions are, are probing deeper. N not that you're looking to drill somebody, but you're looking to better understand them in an interview. Step me through how is a good, describe your situation when, how did you do this? Tell me about that. Again, these are kind of configurations of questions that gets them talking. At the end of the day, really, you should be talking about 20% of the time. The candidate should be talking about 80% of the time. And they should be talking about examples of when and how they did things. Some things maybe to avoid, how would you? Because it's hypothetical, right? If you were, again, what do you think? I mean, what we're not looking for is what they think. We're looking for what they did so we can better understand them. And so try to avoid those areas and try to keep it down to where they have to give you examples um, of how they had to do or, or what type of cultures they've worked in or how they dealt with the problem related to this. Not just, you know, how have you dealt with the problem? That's just kind of too open-ended, right? And so we want to say, how did you deal with the problem when a customer complained about this? And because what you're looking for is their methodology and how they handled that. Keeping it legal. Obviously, um, it's always been important. Um, today, it, it's even more important um, in the sense because there's just so much out there with social media and what have you. Some, some things you can do, though, to keep it legal. Um, and, and these are, I always get lots of questions on this. Um, but what I always say is if you keep focused on these areas, you'll be fine. Assess only job related matters, right? So keep it focused on the job. Be clear about the position qualifications and then interview against them. So this is what we're looking for. And then if you're interviewing against them, like we're talking about, you will be fine. Remain objective and impartial. Um, make sure that uh, your phraseology um, is all job related. So don't get off asking for examples that can get you in trouble uh, with this not job related. Um, so try to keep it job related. So, you know, tell me a time, I'm making this up, tell me a time when you and your brother, I mean, again, not job related, get examples that are job related. And that keeps things from a, a legal standpoint. Be aware of culture distinctions. I mean, th there are differences and, and we all have differences. Um, and, and do make decisions only based on evidence provided. Try not to make assumptions and just base it on evidence um, that you got from the interview. Some don'ts, don't assess anything that is personal. Um, obviously, we all want to get to know somebody personal to make sure it's going to be a good fit, especially when we're small businesses. But you got to be careful on the personal side. Don't let untrained people casually interview candidates. And so I'd be more than happy to share this presentation. You know, make sure somebody's walked through um, if you're going to have somebody else interview with you so they don't do something um, that, that could come out from an illegal side. Don't ask questions that lack direct relation to the job. And don't ask questions that are related to, obviously, children, age, um, any sort of personal, national origin, uh, disabilities. You, you just have to stay away from that. So if you stay focused on what you're looking for for the job, probe in that, you, you'll be fine um, on that side. So we're at a point now where we've interviewed the candidates, we've focused on the job, we've looked and said they're a good culture fit. Um, we've got three or four individuals that we're looking at. And so let's kind of talk through the hiring decision. Um, first, 
choose skillfulness and culture fit. So we want somebody that can fit into what we need from a skill standpoint, but we need to make sure they're also a culture fit. Choose the strongest candidate based upon criteria set. So early on, you set a bunch of criteria. There might be somebody you like more because you both have football in common, right? And, but yet we're not really hiring someone for you to watch football with. We're really hiring for a certain position. So try to keep it back and based upon the criteria that you set early on. Make it an evidence-based decision. You should be able to say, you know what, for what we're looking for, here's where this person did it in their background, or they've been part of this, or they were part of this group. And so you kind of have, you know, you, you feel good knowing that there's things they've done and you kind of know their weaknesses and say, okay, I can train on those things, you know, but they do have this. So here's kind of uh, some four scenarios that I'd like you to think about. Again, this particular process I'm going through, is not one size fits all, um, but I'd like you to think through this. Obviously, if you find someone that has the right skills and the right culture fit, um, what do you do? You hire them, right? <laughs> you hire them right there. Um, if you have somebody who has the wrong skills and is the wrong culture fit, obviously we don't hire them, right? And that, that makes it easy. What if you have somebody that has the wrong skills, but is a great culture fit? Let's put it in a different scenario. Let's say that you are really need a good finance person and they've got to have a financial background, but yet you've got someone from your church or one of your best friends that is just a, a rock star as it relates to personality and would be a great culture fit. Do you hire them? Something I would say I would think about and warn against is probably not because again, they don't have the skill, the minimum skills. And so therefore what will happen is they, if they don't have those minimum skills and you aren't training those minimum skills, their ramp up will be pretty difficult. Let's talk about another scenario. What if they got the right skills, but they're the wrong culture fit? So what if there's a rock star that works for a competitor that you know can bring a million dollars over, but yet you also, they don't fit in your culture. They're arrogant. They think of themselves more than others. They're everything that you're not trying to do, but yet it can put you on the map. And the question is, is do you hire these individuals? These are tough ones, right? Because um, from a business side, you're looking at it from the number side thinking, oh, I can do so much with that. And um, I would just caution against that if we're building for the long term as a business owner and say you probably shouldn't on that side. Again, um, it, nothing's a science, but I would just be looking for both um, in those scenarios. Once we've hired someone to set up a new hire for success, um, first of all, provide a realistic preview and think to yourself, okay, over the first 90 days, you know, what are the priorities that I would like this person to get accomplished? And then recognize it's a two-way street. You know, a lot of times what happens is, is you bring someone on and, and, and you'll go to my next bullet point, you'll set these reviews and you don't speak to them for 90 days. And, um, or you speak to them, but it's all business related. Make sure you get feedback, ask them how it's going. What's the biggest challenge and what's the biggest surprise you've learned in the last 30 days? So you can get a feel for it. Um, obviously provide timely feedback. Um, don't wait for review time in 90 days. If you're seeing something that's not good or you're seeing something they're not doing right, gosh, stop them right then and let them know. Um, because what happens is things pile up. And then you got to be able to adapt and adjust as necessary, right? Not everything's going to go to plan. Um, something will happen with the customer. Something happens here. And so just try to adjust and adapt um, as you go through. So kind of to summarize, you know, if you know where you're going, then you'll know when you get there. Um, once you know what you're looking for, making sure that you're fishing in the right pond, that's that whole skills, right, and culture fit. Look for things in their past um, that will predict that they can do it in the future. Try to compare candidates against the standard and not each other. And then obviously as an organization, no different than you do with a client um, or a vendor, you got one chance to kind of make a good first impression. The uh, second um, part of this and where I'll kind of 
end with this and we can take questions. Is the ISBDC, I was saying, has come up with a brand new program and it's free resources for all members to where basically they've engaged my firm, Quintegra, to work with clients on an essential hire to walk through and do and teach and implement the process I just went through. And so they've invested resources and, and, and several different things to, to open this up. Um, and the whole idea is to be able to help individuals bring on board a key essential hire. So then you can start working on your business versus in your business. Um, a couple things, you, you must be a member of the ISBDC, which is, is free. It, it is for a full-time W-2 employee. So if you're looking for a contractor to work for you know, 90 days, it, it would not include that. For more information, everybody, there's um, several different regional directors in different regions. If you go to isbdc.org slash locations, you can then click on that link. It will take you um, to your location. And then all you got to do is pick up the phone and call them, tell them you'd like to uh, talk about uh, bringing on a, a new individual, and they'll kind of walk you through it. Um, what I've walked through here with you is kind of the real detail side of it. They'll work with you on some of the stuff, even like Jeff was talking about, making sure we have the right you know, compensation, making sure we understand the role of, of what it looks like. And they've got several different things that they'll consult with you on before it would even be able to implement this, just to make sure that you're completely lined up and ready to bring on that new employee. What, Jeff, if any, what questions or comments can I answer? Uh, great, Mark. Thank you. Um, so we don't have any questions in the chat box, but we still have a couple minutes. So if anybody does have any, please feel free to ask. I do have a question for you, though. Um, when it comes to whether or not we use uh, this wonderful opportunity through the ISBDC or not, what do you see as like the like from all the hiring that you've seen happen? What do you see as the most common misstep that like a company that's going to have their first hire makes early on? Yeah, it's a great question. And even for company, their first hire, people have been hiring forever. You know, we, we do, gosh, I don't know, over 500 hires a year. And, and the, the real critical part is, is they don't th think through those must-haves. Mm -hmm. they, they don't think, okay, minimal. And, and there's a lot of good books out there. And you always hear, you know, hire, hire for culture, you know, and, and, and train for the other. I agree with that. But if there's minimum skills they have to have, they can be the greatest person in the world, but they'll never, they'll, they'll, you'll overwhelm them because they won't be able to bring that competency that you need. And so, so many, even hiring managers, even the large companies are small. That's the key thing that they don't, they don't really think through. You, you had a great example. And, and that is, is, you know, I want this person to have a degree, but it, does it really, do they have to really have it? And if the answer is no, they don't, then that opens your pool up. If the answer is yes, then it shrinks the pool down. And, you know, the example I use about sales, you know, bring me a good salesperson with the right attitude and man, I, I'll hire him in a second. You know and I mean? It's like, yes, big picture, but let's talk about what kind of sales, because like my example, if it's a door to door sales and they got to go door to door cold calling and to, to sell something instead of somebody sitting behind the desk and taking an influx of conversations that come to them. Those are two totally different types of sales. And I'm not saying it won't work, but the odds of someone sitting behind a desk and, and answering the phone and someone going out there banging on the door trying to sell security systems or what have you um, is two totally different traits. Now, yeah. you, might you, you might decide though, hey, this person was in this, and let's take a young person. This person earlier played these types of athletics where they had to go do this, or a person did fundraising and they did, and that I, could, I can transfer that skill into what we're doing. And, and so, I mean, those are the things I think you got to think through. I think that's so good too. And, and so applicable. We, um, it's always been one of the more challenging things is thinking through, is this a must have, or is this as I want to have? And right. that's so valuable. Uh, we did have a question come through. So um, how have you seen the job market change since this COVID uh, crisis has happened um, from the employer point of view? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I, I think it's 
depends on the industry. So there are certain industries that it's still a very tight market. Um, the construction and some of those industries in manufacturing, obviously you, you get into some other industries um, and it's completely different. Um, and, and it's saturated on that side. And, and so some industries won't come back for a while um, and some others. And so it's not a one size fits all. And so when you look at unemployment, you know, that's compiling everything together. Um, but yet there are certain industries that are hiring um, and there's still a very, very skill short market in those areas that as there were before uh, COVID. That's great. Um, Mark, I think that's the end of our questions here. I'm going to stop your share real quick so I can okay. share my screen one last time um, so we can wrap up here. Um, so everybody, thanks again to Mark for, for taking the time out of your day to come talk through this uh, topic with us. I think it's really impactful to know, for one, to help with that, that loneliness, overwhelm, like we can hire somebody to help. Um, and you guys are there to help us do that uh, going through the ISBDC. Um, for those who are on here uh, that may be here for the first time, um, we have a wonderful website that has all of our resources for the ISBDC on it at stayinbiz.org. Um, and that is a place that you'll be able to get connected with your local ISBDC uh, representative um, that can help us uh, get connected with Mark and the Quintegra team. Um, and just again, thanks to everybody that's been here today. Um, Next week's topic is going to be on rem, uh, managing remote employees, which is a new thing for everybody, uh, for a lot of us. Um, and so we're gonna uh, have a, a teammate from Generator. Our team is largely all virtual and all remote. Um, and so uh, our one of our managing directors, Lauren Usher, will be with us next week to talk about managing best practices to man handle managing re remote employees. So looking forward to seeing everybody there. Thanks again, Mark, we appreciate it. Um, and everybody have a wonderful rest of your Friday.